Okay, so we're, we're recording. So I want to make a few, a uh, couple general observations uh, about my role at, in this class and why I'm doing the announcements the way I'm doing them. And then I want to make some comments and observations about the material covered in chapter 12. So let's start off. Well, let me turn to the PowerPoint for just a moment. Here we go. Now, people often use the word professor and teacher uh, almost as synonyms. Now, the two, much like ethics and morals, there's a similar relationship between teacher and professor. Like ethics and morals are related because they have the same ultimate outcome, how people decide to behave in relationship to other people. Uh, so professor versus teacher has a similar relation, but also distinction because um, a professor, both a professor and a teacher are educators, but our roles are a bit different. Here's the thing, um, teachers are required to have expertise in the particular subject area that they teach. They do not, however, typically have graduate degrees. Um, they are also required to take classes in the theory of education so they can, along the way, teach students how to learn. But folks, you're now in college. And by this point, you are supposed to already learn how to learn. Professors, instead, we have graduate degrees. We are subject matter specialists. Now, as a rule, we're not required to take edu education classes, although some of us, myself included, have attended symposia uh, on the theory of education in order to be able to provide remedial help where necessary. But because we're primarily subject matter specialists, our role is somewhat different. We are required to provide, expected to pro provide background in the area that students may need to engage successfully with material. We're supposed to provide context. How does the material in the field relate to other areas in the field and other fields as well? Like for example, when we talked about predestination, I referred to Platonic metaphysics and, and contrasted that with Whiteheadian metaphysics. Metaphysics can have a bearing on ethics. Now, that said, um, we're also um, supposed to model how to engage with the material. Good scholars do not just fill and spill. I think it's the expression, we don't just absorb the material and then recite it on command. Rather, we engage with the material actively, critically, independently, and yes, this is the fun part, sometimes creatively. That includes not only understanding the material, but also analyzing how it's structured. If you have difficulties following a work, figuring out how it is put together is an important aid to comprehension. I pointed out bits of this approach on both uh, the essay by Singer and the essay by Lewis, critiquing whether our fellow scholars have fulfilled their tasks up to the standard scholarship. Now, it's important to emphasize the critique is not the same thing as criticize. It includes assessing both what is done well, as well as where there are issues in a given work of scholarship. So when I point out issues with our textbook, that is, um, but also point out things our, our writers have done well, that is a critique, not a criticism. Synthesizing various works, much like how our authors in chapter eight balanced advantages and disadvantages in the various ethical systems they had already covered in order to suggest their own system of ethics. The creative part of scholarship, and the, that's the part that I enjoy, is to use these other intellectual skills I've just talked about in order to arrive at a new insight in a given area. 
That explains what I've been trying to do in these announcements. I sometimes point out telling aspects of how our readings are structured, particularly if the reading in question is something that I know that students in the, in the past have found challenging. I raise questions and address gaps in the coverage provided by the authors. I have sometimes pointed out that various ideas may not be so much an either or, but a both and. In order to challenge you to work out your own synthesis. It's not just a matter of opining about duty ethics versus consequentialist ethics. Is there a way that you can come up with combining or reconciling the best world systems, for example? I've also been writing these announcements in outline format in order to give visual cues as to which ideas are subordinate to others. And because from what I've learned in educational symposia, I understand students often find dense paragraphs to be daunting. That's also why I've been generously using, generously using images in the videos to help those of you who have a primarily visual learning modality access the material. And yes, I admit I often use pop culture references. I use these not in order to establish points, but to help illustrate them in a relatable form. That said, whether or not you're familiar with the works I allude to, um, the fact the themes that we've been covering are often expressed in popular culture, media, and news illustrate how ethics informs our everyday lives. We are social animals, and ethics is all about how we engage with each other in society. And that's reflected in popular fiction and media. Now, let me turn to uh, some comments and observations uh, about chapter 12. So, it's important to emphasize um, point out that on page 246, our authors once again seem to be equating intuition with feeling. Although there is a connection between the two, there's also an important distinction. The problem, I suspect, lies in how the word feeling can refer both to emotional states and to intuition. But in the context of philosophy, when we speak about intuition, we mean something that upon being stated appears to be self-evident. There is no emotion, for example, in stating if A, then B, A, therefore B. All men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Um, this classic syllogism from Aristotelian logic is intuitive, it's self-evident once it is stated. On page 247, our authors were observed that what the majority does has nothing to do with what they ought to do. This is an example of the bandwagon fallacy. Just because an idea, notion, or practice has a wide following does not in itself prove that it is good, right, or just. On page 247, we also have a section that they title Domino Argument. Uh, I think I've talked about this before. It kind of annoys me that what they call a domino argument is more properly known as a slippery slope. But um, got ahead of myself there. Um, but that does provide a section, that section does provide an example of what we call the big lie, which is a tactic that is often used by authoritarian regimes to swing the masses. On page 250, the notion raises the notion that it may be appropriate to lie in instances involving national security. And let me give you a pop culture reference. My wife and I recently binged this TV series, ran three seasons, called The Bletchley Circle. Now, the historical context is that during World War II, 
Many brilliant British women were recruited to work as code, break, code breakers at a covert establishment in, a, in Bletchley Park, hence the name. Uh, after the war, however, they were covered by the British Official Secrets Act. They had to resign themselves to limited roles afforded women after the war and could never cite their qualifications based on the work they'd done during the war in order to move forward in their lives. Now, this is a fictional series, but that is the historical background. This series posits a number of these women getting back in touch after the war and using their skills as code breakers to solve mysteries that have a uh, Scotland Yard stump. Now, by law, they were, they are forbidden in the story to share their specialized skills with anyone outside of their circle. Again, hence the name. For example, one woman is a genius at pattern recognition. Another one is, uh, has a photographic memory. And a third one is skilled in many languages. And the fourth one is the leader. Um, but throughout the series, that raises an ethical challenge. Because on the one hand, because of the Official Secrets Act, they are forbidden to share why they are qualified to address these problems. There are challenging Scotland Yard, but they also feel ethically compelled to use their distinctive skills to address you know, one story arc, um, the pattern of killings of a serial killer, and another to exonerate a woman who has been convicted of a crime she did not commit. Also, so is it right, ethical, or just that these brilliant women, not these fictional ones, but the ones in real life, were required to hide their extraordinary abilities after World War II. Page 255 addresses the ethics of cheating and using falsified qualifications. And again, I have to give you another pop culture reference. The movie, Steven Spielberg's movie, Catch Me If You Can. Lino Leonardo DiCaprio and Tom Hanks tells the mostly true story of a young man by the name of Frank Abagnale who made a career out of falsifying qualifications and also checks and the cat and mouse game he played with an FBI agent over several years. After being caught, he used his skills as a forger to have the, help the FBI detect people doing the same kind of cons that he ran. And in fact, he is still alive and reformed. And he makes his living advising companies about how to avoid scammers such as he was. Page 200, 259 addresses the ethics of breaking promises and its resultant destruction of social trust. Perhaps the greatest example of that is discussed in the works of Hannah Arendt. Now, she doesn't use this phrase epistemic seizure, but that's what it comes down to. Uh, Epistemic seizure is a common aspect of authoritarian regimes. What they do is they set out to destabilize people's perception that there is an objective reality. When you do that, people are naturally inclined to give their loyalty and devotion to the authorities, uh, in part in order to secure some sense of a stable reality. It's very common and it's very dangerous. On page 263, the authors put forth a rationale for stealing on the theory that the economic system is corrupt. If you're looking for a classic example of this rationale, the story of Robin Hood is the gift to. Now, at this point, I think I'm just, I've gone past uh, my two page goal with this announcement. So I think I'll hold off and making further observations about Judith uh, Jarvis's defense of abortion and Scott Kusendorf's The Vanishing Pro-Life Apologist, putting the life back in the abortion debate. Um, I'll probably be recording that shortly and uploading. 
So that's my thoughts on that reading. Let me know if any of these observations or comments require elaboration or clarification. Ciao for now.